And welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Aaron Gilchrist, and that... You just heard it there. That is the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange today. This is following the Federal Reserve slashing its key interest rate by an aggressive half a percentage point. Now, the reaction from the market fairly subdued today with stocks moving slightly higher immediately after the news and then coming back down a bit to close roughly flat on the day. Now, this is the central bank's first interest rate cut since the pandemic, as it warned the economic outlook was uncertain. During a press conference this afternoon, Fed Chair Jerome Powell told reporters the cut was a good start and a sign of confidence. What message are you trying to send American consumers, the American people, with this unusually large rate cut? I, I would just say that, you know, the U.S. economy is in a good place and, and our our decision today is designed to keep it there. More specifically, the economy is growing at a solid pace. Inflation is coming down closer to our 2 percent objective over time. And the labor market is, is still in solid shape. Is the Federal Reserve effectively de declaring a decisive victory over inflation and rising prices? No, um, we're not. Now, the move to cut rates for the first time in four years comes just 48 days before Election Day as voters continue to signal their frustrations about economic gains versus the cost of everyday goods. The Fed decision also comes amid an intensifying economic messaging battle on the campaign trail, with Harris and Trump trying to define each other. Donald Trump will give billionaires massive cuts, massive tax cuts, and cut corporate taxes by over a trillion dollars. He intends to cut Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> And he wants to impose what I call a Trump sales tax on everyday basic necessities. Look, she's going to double up your taxes. She wants to terminate the Trump tax cut. She's got one thing that's incredible, an unrealized capital gain tax that will drive every business out of the United States. And they're going to raise the capital gains tax, Willie, a lot. The vice president and the former president have both leaned into their economic agendas, although in very different ways. Vice President Harris, who has at times struggled to defend the Biden administration's economic record, focusing on her own plans to address high costs on housing, child care, food and business startups, those costs as well, and trying to gently break with the Biden administration on key tax issues, including how much to raise the capital gains and corporate tax rate. Now, Donald Trump, meanwhile, has tried to gloss over the impacts of the pandemic on his economic record while proposing a wide swath of tax cuts, often without many details, on everything from tips to Social Security and local taxes, which he says would be paid for by increasing tariffs on overseas goods, something many economists warn could balloon the deficit and raise prices. So let's talk more about what the Fed's decision will mean with NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung. So, Brian, we've been anticipating this cut right for a while now. Uh, is, is this where you expected the Fed would end up? How significant is a, a half a percentage point cut here? Well, it actually had a lot of Wall Street analysts and just casual market watchers a little bit surprised. Someone said, we didn't expect the Fed to cut by half a percentage point, maybe something like a quarter percentage point. But it's important to remember exactly how we got here and the reason why interest rates were high in the first place. The big story post-pandemic was inflation, inflation, inflation. Inflation going up to around 9% at its peak in the summer of 2022. During that process, the Federal Reserve, which is the steward of the U.S. economy through their interest rate policy, said, all right, we need to raise borrowing costs to take steam out of this economy to make inflation go down. And it largely did that job. But the question is, OK, well, now with inflation going sideways here, it's certainly a vast improvement from that 9 percent. Can they cut interest rates to make sure that this economy doesn't hit the tarmac too hard? And the, hitting the tarmac too hard would look like this unemployment ticking up more substantially than it is right now. It's a little hard to see because unemployment did take uh, peak at around 15 percent. You can see it's actually been drifting up a little bit over the past few months. It was around three and a half percent. The last measure was 4.2 percent. That's why the Federal Reserve said, you know what, let's recalibrate our policy, cut interest rates by half a percentage point to make sure that unemployment doesn't go up any further. But indeed, a surprise to some, Aaron. So, Brian, let's break this down for for the folks at home in a, in a real world application sort of a way here. What do these cuts actually mean for people as they're going about their lives, trying to figure out how to spend and save. 
Yeah, well, all of that that I just went through was kind of like econ textbook <laughs> stuff. But what does it mean for regular people? Well, uh, we're talking about mortgages, auto rates, and also credit card rates, right? And they've gone up substantially as a result of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Here are your average uh, rates that you were paying in 2020 for a 30-year fixed mortgage for a car loan in addition to your credit cards. And check out what it looks like in 2024, right? We all know the mortgage market is a lot more painful now than it was in 2020. 6.1% is your 30-year fixed mortgage rate. 8.6% for auto loans and 21.5% for credit cards by some measures an all-time high. So what we can expect after the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by half a percentage point today is, all right, these interest rates, which are tied indirectly to what the Fed does, they're not going to go down by exactly half a percentage point, but they should be going down. In fact, mortgage rates have already been coming down over the past few months. It was around 8% in October of last year. It's been drifting down in anticipation of what the Fed did today with your auto loans and credit card rates. These could go down a little bit more marginally in the next few months as well. And so, Brian, very quickly, what comes next here? The, the Fed hinted at uh, additional cuts potentially. Yeah, well, the Federal Reserve also had projections for where interest rates could go from here, and the projection is at least another 50 basis points or 0.5% in interest rate cuts by the end of this year. That implies there could be uh, more interest rate cuts in their November and December meetings, which are on the calendar uh, for the rest of 2024, Aaron. All right, Brian Chung for us today. Brian, thank you. And joining me now is Jason Furman, former, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. Uh, Jason, thanks for being here today. First, I do want to get your reaction to today's announcement from the Fed. Uh, what, what's your take on this? I think it's terrific, and it's a real vote of confidence in the U.S. economy, and it's well-deserved. Inflation has come down a lot. It's not all the way to the Fed's target, but it's getting closer. The risks have grown a little bit on the employment side, not a lot. And so the Fed is starting this process of getting us back to normal. And we have the Fed telling Americans that, that its plan is working, that inflation is cooling, right? Lay folks, voters have, have said, that's not the reality at my house. So even if economic fundamentals are strong at this point, how do you explain this to people who say they still feel a gut punch from, from high prices? Yeah, look, the problem is that people are rightfully incredibly frustrated about the huge increase in prices in 2021, 2022, and into 2023. And the Fed cannot undo that. We cannot get prices back to where they were in 2019. The only way to do that would be to engineer just a massive depression. What the Fed can do is get us going forward back to normal. Um, inflation rising at 2% a year. And the good news is wages are rising a lot faster than 2% a year. So every year people are starting to make up some of that lost ground, but it's not going to get there right away. Um, and the best they can do is just start the process and keep it going. And that's what they're doing now. I do want to ask you, too, about your op-ed in The Wall Street Journal this week. And, and you argue uh, in, in this race, this presidential race, the evaluation is clear. Mr. Trump's ideas on tariffs, the budget, and the Federal Reserve pose a much greater risk to the, to the economy than Ms. Harris's. Now, you say that both of them have floated bad ideas. Uh, expand on what you've written here. Yeah, so, you know, in political campaigns, there's all sorts of things that are about appealing to voters rather than appealing to economists. I get that. I also hear a bunch of ideas that I like, um, you know, uh, Vice President Harris talking about expanding the child tax credit. But when it comes to economic growth, yeah, the big three are, are you going to have a huge across the board tariff, trade war, tax on families? Trump wants to do that. It would be terrible. Um, what are you going to do to the budget deficit? Neither of them are taking it seriously enough. Uh, but Trump is proposing much more deficit increases. And finally, the Fed, um, this administration has been very good at respecting the independence of the Fed, letting it make the hard choices that have put us um, on this better economic track. So one of the, the big questions that we hear up here uh, during campaign seasons is the question of, is the economy better than it was four years ago? If, if that is the case now, why is that not something we've heard the vice president lean into more in, in her talking about the economy? Look, I don't know exactly how to phrase things. If you're trying to be president, um, I can tell you what the facts are about the economy, which is it's a really impressive recovery. By the way, we're the envy of the world. I travel around the world and people would love their economies to be like the United States in terms of our economic growth, our productivity growth, our inflation rate, uh, our employment rate. Uh, we're in much, much better shape than we're in. But, you know, 
it's still hard for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people haven't recovered from the inflation. The unemployment rate has ticked up a little bit recently. And so how to get this, you know, both halves of the message, the challenges you face, the strengths, and be forward looking about here's, you know, what I'm going to do about it. That, that's not easy. I do want to ask you something. We'll put something on the screen here. This is from uh, Donald Trump's proposed tax cuts. What would the impact of all these proposals be on the federal budget, practically, as you look at it? Could, could we handle this sort of a, a drop in revenue? Yeah, so my math skills aren't good enough to add all that up, but it looks to me like it's over $10 trillion. That is enormous, massive. I mean, if you did something like that, you would rekindle a huge amount of inflation. The Fed would have to raise interest rates quite a lot to offset that. Um, you know, other taxes would probably need to go up. Um, that's somewhere between, you know, sort of fake pandering that's never going to happen is the good case here. And, you know, something that, that will happen and, and causes all that harm is, is the bad case here. So we, we know that every president sort of takes a big swing on economic legislation, right? As we just have just a few seconds left here, I do want to ask you, we know for Obama it was health care, for Trump it was, it was tax cuts, for Biden it was the IRA. What would you want to see a President Harris go big on uh, were she to, to win the election? If I only got one word, it would be children. Um, that was the part of Biden's agenda he did not get done on a permanent basis. Um, there's so much more we could do to expand opportunities for children, invest in children, reduce children's poverty. We know how to do all of that. Um, I would love to see her do it, and it would help um, the economy over the longer term as well. All right, Jason Furman, we appreciate your time and your perspective today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the decision to lower rates will certainly get some play on the campaign trail as both candidates are looking to sell their economic visions now. Moments ago in Raleigh, North Carolina, the Republican vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, weighing in on this using today's Fed decision to renew a Trump campaign argument blaming Biden and Harris's policies for the recent rise in prices. It's better than nothing. But again, the reason why we have sky high inflation, the reason why we have high interest rates is because Kamala Harris cast the deciding vote on the Inflation Explosion Act, and then she tried to do everything she could to shut down American energy. So Americans are suffering from this st stuff, and the fact that the Fed is gonna give them a little relief in the midst of an election, by the way, is nothing compared to the disaster that Kamala Harris's policies have caused in this country. And moments ago, Harris called the Fed decision, quote, welcome news for Americans who have borne the brunt of high prices. So joining me now is NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd uh, to sort of pick apart this and some other things of the day. So, Chuck, first I'll ask you, the, the Fed decision that, that came down today, what's your read on that and how the campaigns might see it? Look, I was uh, the, the half point rather than the quarter point, I think, is, is certainly something that um, should settle the markets, should please the markets. Um, what was interesting was sort of the coverage of this debate mm -hmm. between quarter and half, and the perception was, well, if Powell doesn't want to be accused of somehow uh, putting a finger on the scale with the election, look, I'm first election I covered, uh, one of the presidential candidates blamed the Fed chair for lowering interest rates and somehow helping the opponent. I mean, this isn't a new criticism. Um, I thought it was very gentle criticism that Vance made there. He made. And oh, by the way, during an election year, yeah. sort of implying that maybe this was the case. But I think Powell would have looked like he was being too cautious and too worried about political outcomes if he'd only gone a quarter point here. So this, to me, looks like, and I've spent a lot of time with, 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 the, with Chairman Powell, it, this looks like more of in accordance with how he behaves, not necessarily a political guy. Thank and you we should remember, it. he is... A Trump appointee. Right, right, he is. <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you, too, you know, the campaigns have, have been talking about their economic policies and plans, mm -hmm. things that have sort of been uh, sweet, right, dropping these, the sure. candy for, for, for voters. Do you no think, pain at all. Well, right. but, and we know that some of these things just won't work right. in, in different ways. Do you think voters are enticed by that, or do they sort of see through it? Well, I think that I assume voters see through this now since we've been through so many promises and seeing what can't get done and things like that. It, I will say this. I think it's been a bit risky of Harris not to have a lot out there, not to sort of you asked a fascinating question, because think about this. At this point in a campaign, we normally have an idea of what's the big thing they're going to do. Yeah. Right. We knew that with Biden, that it was going to be covid related, but it was going to be a big thing involving you knew with, as you pointed out, Trump with tax cuts. We knew with Obama, he made that health care pledge during his primary campaign. What is her first hundred days? 
What is the, on day one, I'm going to do X? We know what he's going to try to do on day one. Whether you agree with it or not, there are plans to do that. I think this, and I understand it's very, I'd say a bit risk averse. You put too much paper out there and suddenly you're the center and she wants to make Trump the story and everything about that. And look, his tariff proposals, I think, have been easy for Harris to beat up on and she's and talking to him that way. So there's risk in putting it. But I wonder if that's, it, you know, if that's going to hurt her at some point. If voters are going, yeah, 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 I don't like what he's doing, but what are you going to do? And it's been a lot of vagueness. We don't have, it was interesting what he said, I'm surprised she hasn't leaned further into some sort of care economy yeah. tax break. Not just for child care, but long-term care, because we all have now, uh, I'm in a generation of squeezed, right? We got parents right. and kids yeah. that, yeah, that uh, fall into this care economy. It's a good place for her to be. I'm just surprised there's been no details. Last thing I want to ask you about this. Harris appears to have closed the gap in some of the polling mm -hmm. on, on the economy. Right. Uh, how big of a deal is that for, for the campaign? Well, not only that, Aaron, you know who's noticed this? The Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. They're out with some blistering ads now over the last two days that I've noticed that put her, connect her to Bidenomics, have her talking how good Bidenomics is. They realize being separated from Joe Biden has helped her perception with voters on the economy. The Trump campaign realized Biden's name next to the economy is negative. It's a bad thing to be associated with. I'll be curious to see if they stay disciplined. They, they, I think they think if you tie her more back to Biden, she will then feel the impact of people's negative perceptions on Biden's economy. If it starts to get traction, I think she's going to have to find a way to separate herself from Biden's economy here a little bit because Biden's economy is unpopular. And why do we know this? Because Harris has so far been able to separate herself yeah. on this issue. I do want to turn to your column now yes. and talk about the, the state of our current political discourse. Yeah. And it, it was a fascinating read. It, was, it, uh, it went through a range of emotions I, <laughs> thinking I look, about some of the stuff. It's frustrating, here. Yeah. isn't it, to watch this? Because I know we all know, and ultimately we realize, I, I, I think we've, we've, we've perverted ourselves. We are living in a funhouse mirror. And I watch it with members of, with friends and family of mine, who have this view of people on the other side of the, whatever the other whatever their other side is, that is very perverted, and it's and you realize people are being served up the worst version of their political foes. Mm. They're not even. It's not that. It's not, it, it's the worst version, and and we wonder how. Why do these? Why are these stories believed before they're debunked? And you know, I don't think we fully appreciate how much our information ecosystem has really been abused and used to divide us. Look, are and politicians exploiting it? Is Donald Trump exploiting this? Yes. There's no doubt. But that's who's putting us in these positions. Well, and you suggested it's happening in a couple of different ways. First, from the campaigns and the candidates themselves mm -hmm. uh, and the surrogates and, and all the like out there talking about each other or, or their, their, their... Well, their, what happens their, is, right, you know, you react, right. You, yeah. you get attacked and then you feel like you need to fight back and you start using the same language. And then you start, the, it's, the, it's the demonization, and, the, and we've gotten to this, and the impact that has on a mentally disturbed person. Mm. Look, most people are not going to act out on their threats, but the mentally, you know, there are mentally challenged folks who could get impacted by this. That's what, we've learned this with any kind of shooter, any kind of attempted assassin. They, they are, they have a fragile, they have a fragile mind. They've gotten impacted by this, and, and I don't, and the irresponsibility, again, Obviously, there's some irresponsible political leaders here, but our tech companies have algorithmic us into this division, and we can't seem to get out of well, this. Well, that was the other now. thing I wanted to ask you about, and we'll put uh, a part of your column up on the screen here mm -hmm. so f folks can see it as well. You said the problem with political discourse in America right now is that we are all stuck in a social media funhouse mirror booth. What we see isn't what is, and how we're seen isn't who we are, and yet here we are. Uh, th this sort of lines up with what we've been talking about with Springfield and, and Springfield, Ohio, and, and the, the cats and such. Right, and, and, it's, it's, um, and, and everybody rationalizes their harsh rhetoric by saying, but didn't you see this? Mm. And you're like, you're, you're, you got a perverted version of this. And yet they don't believe us anymore as you know, the mainstream media filter. And we can go through a variety of reasons why that's the case. But I think it goes back to these algorithms that just feed more stuff to you in order to keep you online, keep you engaged, and we all know anger and fear. You know, it, it's interesting. I've seen a few experiments. If you, if you get people to pause before they respond to something, or if you suggest using less toxic words, it's mm -hmm. amazing how you can de-escalate a situation quickly. What's really frustrating is human beings are automatic de-escalators. 
for some reason well, we're online. Used to be. <laughs> well, I think even no, yeah. when we're physically together. Together, yes. It's it's the fact when there's no human interaction, no human connection, there's no de-escalator. And you have to hope that there's some way to, to find the middle ground. And I know, I, in, I'm a middle-aged guy era. yelling yeah. at yelling at the <laughs> yelling into the void. But um, we do. I don't think we have talked about this problem enough. Yeah. It is not a one-sided problem. There, this this is an this is an issue that our information ecosystem has been poisoned by these algorithms and yeah. social media companies, and we need to face up to it. I encourage folks to read Chuck's uh, column on NBCNews.com right now. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. You got it. Coming up, uh, Trump hits a highly competitive House district on Long Island, holding his first rally since Sunday's apparent assassination attempt. We are live in New York next. Plus, a second wave of explosions hitting Lebanon as Hezbollah vows retaliation against Israel for a stunning attack targeting the group's communication devices. You're watching Meet the Press now. And welcome back. We are 48 days out from polls closing, and former President Donald Trump is making a campaign stop in an unorthodox place, Long Island, New York. Later tonight, the former president is holding a rally at the former home of the NHL's New York Islanders. The Empire State, not a battleground, of course, but it is home to several hotly contested House races that could decide which party controls Congress come January. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris is here in Washington speaking at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's leadership conference that was earlier today, focusing her remarks on health care and reproductive health. And while both candidates have been holding out hope for a potential endorsement from the Teamsters, that powerful union now says it will not be endorsing a presidential candidate this cycle. Both the Trump campaign and the Harris campaign putting out statements implying the union's members support their respective candidates. Joining me now from Long Island, New York, is NBC's Ali Vitale, and outside the White House is Mike Memoli. Uh, Ali, I'll start with you there uh, in New York, less than 50 days away now from Election Day. Why is Donald Trump holding a rally in Long Island in a very Democratic state? Well, Trump was on Truth Social the other day saying that Long Island was a sign that New York itself could be in play at the presidential level. That's pretty far-fetched, but the reality is it is very much a centerpiece to the Republican plan to hold control of the House. Back in 2022, this is the state that was really the road to the majority for Republicans. There were various districts, including this one on Long Island, that flipped from blue to red. Now it's in the hands of Congressman Anthony Desposito. He's won of the Congress people who is here at this Trump rally. And as he was walking in, I asked him about the reality that this is a district he won in 2022, but it's also a district that Biden won in 2020 by about 10 points. It's also gone through redistricting since then. It's gotten slightly bluer in its demographic makeup. Nevertheless, Desposito saying that having Trump here is a good thing, despite the private whispers that it could be politically problematic for some of these members like Desposito who are in swing seats that they have to retain if Republicans hope to hold on to the majority after November. I, I want to ask you too, Ali, ahead of this trip, Trump floated a, a very popular tax cut to folks there on Long Island, right? What can you tell us about this SALT deduction and, and how it's uh, a change for, for Donald Trump in, in his tune? <laughs> A significant change, especially because SALT deductions were rolled back because of the tax jobs, tax and jobs bill that Trump himself pushed through Congress back during his administration. SALT, though, is something that angered New Yorkers through the ire of New York members, New Jersey members of Congress as well. So the fact that Trump is sort of reversing course, saying he's going to bring back SALT deductions, a tax deduction that New Yorkers and New Jersey voters very badly would like to be able to use again. That is notable. It is a flip-flop, but it is also a sign that he, A, knows his New York constituency and knows where he's about to be campaigning. It's also something that, again, is not a Republican priority writ large, and it is a flip-flop for him, but notable to see him sort of casting policy in a way where it goes more with the polls of where he's campaigning rather than what his actual policy platforms have been in the past. I'll be interested, as someone who covers both Congress and the campaign trail in seeing if it's something that makes its way here to a New York crowd that would probably be excited to hear it.
I do want to ask you very quickly before I let you go. Obviously, this is Donald Trump's first uh, big rally since the apparent assassination attempt over the weekend. Albeit, yeah. we know that wasn't uh, a campaign event. It was an, an OTR, as we call it. What should we expect to hear from him uh, in front of this friendly crowd at this hockey arena? Well, look, he was talking about it even last night in Michigan, the realities of how the campaign trail has changed for him, in part because of the attempted assassination in Butler, Pennsylvania. And then, of course, in light of what happened this weekend, Secret Service thwarting a man who was at his golf course and trying to have Trump in his sights, literally, with the gun that he had with him. Of course, that's something Trump has talked about. We'll see if he talks about it here. But I can tell you, from a security posture on the ground, there's always a big security presence here, Secret Service and other law enforcement agencies on the local level working together to make sure that these kinds of events are safe. I have been to more than 100 of these Trump rallies over the years. Just because there's a heightened posture doesn't mean you can always see it. Certainly today, there's a sensitivity. We even saw it this morning in talking to the police commissioner here, but he assured me he thinks that this is an event that is 100% safe. Of course, that's exactly what we want to hear. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you for that. Mike Memoli, let me bring you in here. We know that the, the Harris campaign had been hoping for a Teamsters endorsement today. What do we know about uh, what went into the Teamsters decision and, and the reaction to it? Well, the campaign is responding by pointing to the fact that there are some individual local chapters of the Teamsters Union that have endorsed her. They're also pointing to the fact that the records of these candidates, Vice President Harris versus former President Trump, uh, very clearly, in their view, illustrate which one is much better for uh, workers. And this really does speak to, though, uh, two different dynamics. One is there has been an emerging gap between the leadership of major labor unions, most of which nationally have endorsed Vice President Harris very quickly after previously endorsing President Biden. But also there is uh, this divide between the rank and file and that leadership, because many, as the polling released by the Teamsters just hours before their uh, endorsement, non-endorsement came out, showed that uh, some surveys they had conducted of their membership over different periods showed actually overwhelming support for Donald Trump, two to one in, in one phone poll. Now, we have, don't have insight into the methodology, but that is an interesting window into how this uh, split potentially plays out. And Mike, very quickly, we know the vice president spoke to the National Association of Black Journalists yesterday. Today, she spoke to the Congressional uh, Hispanic Caucus Institute's conference. What do we know about what's on tap for the vice president the rest of this week? Well, it's interesting and just speaking about that event today for one minute, because the focus on her part, despite the focus on migration and immigrants and the, the specifically as it relates to Springfield, Illinois, her focus actually was on the economy, which speaks to the fact that pollsters and different uh, analysts tell you that no matter every age group, ethnicity, demographic you can think of, the economy is the number one issue. But we are going to see the vice president continuing to travel this week. She has that very big event with Oprah. Of course, we saw her convention speech in Chicago. They're conducting this national uh, virtual event focused on what they say is the theme of unity. We know how important that is at this moment. Uh, the vice president also now, we understand, may be uh, changing her schedule to travel to Georgia. The, uh, her running mate, Tim Walls, was just there in the last 24 hours, speaks to their uh, optimism continuing to focus on that state as well. All right, Mike Memoli for us uh, right down the street there near the White House. Mike, thank you. Let me bring in our panel now. Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill. Donna Edwards, former Democratic congresswoman from Maryland and an NBC News political analyst. And Sarah Fagan, Republican strategist and an NBC News contributor. Ladies, thank you all for being here. Julia, I'll start with you as we now see that uh, this gathering is about to happen on Long Island for the Trump yeah. campaign. What do you make of that and that use of resources 48 days out from the election? Yeah, so a lot of this goes down, obviously, to the battle of the House majority, which much of it runs through much of downstate New York, Long Island in particular. And this is Donald Trump very much trying to bring the rest of the ticket along with him. And this will be a big test of that. Look, New York is interesting because it's obviously a blue state. But I think in the 2022 midterms, there were some Republicans, particularly in that gubernatorial race with uh, Lieutenant or Governor Kathy Hochul running, that may maybe had a closer margin than what Democrats were hoping for, made them a little nervous. So you have these deep red pockets of uh, New York state that Republicans are very much trying to capitalize on, Donald Trump trying to give them 
some headwinds. So, Sarah, is that the reality for them? Is Donald Trump going to be helpful to these Republicans uh, down ballot in New York State or, or not? You know, I think he's helpful. I mean, look, anytime you have a president or former president, they bring in so much of the activist base, and that is really a big part of winning a campaign, particularly in a congressional race that may, in some of these districts, were decided by a few hundred votes. So that matters, and also the financial piece of it. You know, a huge piece of the financial epicenter in all of politics is in New York. And so, you know, there, there typically are donor events associated with mm -hmm. this. They might be off camera, the people don't know about. So bringing a president in is almost always a positive thing, and there's always, always multiple reasons to do it. And Donna, on the Democrat side, uh, obviously presidentially this is a, a blue state we're talking about. Do you think the Democrats are doing enough in New York State, uh, knowing that the, the control of the House could be hanging in the balance here in terms of what the, the Harris campaign is doing to be helpful in that space? Well, there are a handful of districts in New York that the Democrats have prioritized. Uh, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee has put them high on the list. They're spending real money in those districts. They also are raising money nationally in those districts. I think Democrats believe that there's a real shot at getting those districts back into the uh, Democratic column. And as a result, they've invested a lot of resources. And you can see it on the ground. I mean, the, the special election that happened, um, you could see that as well. And I think Democrats feel really confident about those districts. I do want to talk a little bit about the Fed decision that we got today, Julia, and we know that, that uh, there's been this disconnect, right, between what some of the, the economists, the big brains are saying about uh, where the economy is right now, uh, and, and obviously there's the economic message, but there's also the political message. Do you get the sense that voters are hearing this message today from the Fed and, and it's resonating with them, or is there still sort of this vibe session that we're dealing with that people are not feeling it? You know, I think the vibe session could still be happening. I'm curious to see after this decision, once, once this decision sinks in, how voters respond to it. But look, on this issue of inflation in particular, we are still seeing in polling, at least, that voters do still feel that goods are still, uh, good, the prices of goods are still high. It's still um, maybe trickier for them to buy a home, for example. But but both candidates, Kamala Harris and also vice presidential candidate on the other side, J.D. Vance, being very careful about how they talk about that position. We know that or that uh, issue. We know that Chuck Todd said the segment earlier. That's something uh, candidates have been historically very careful to approach. Now, Donna, I want to play something for viewers at home. This is the vice president sort of getting that. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Question yesterday. Take a listen to this. Four years ago, when we came in, um, we came in during the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. As of today, we have created over 16 million new jobs, over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs. We have the lowest black unemployment rate in generations. Is the price of groceries still too high? Yes. Do we have more work to do? Yes. So, Donna, does that answer work? I mean, is it, is it enough to, to, to sort of walk this line between what they see as the good that the Biden administration did, but recognizing, too, that people are still not necessarily feeling in their own pockets that things are, are getting better? Well, you have the facts of what this economy has produced over the last uh, four years, and I think the vice president is rightfully pointing to those things. And then you have the reality of how people feel. And I think one of the mistakes that's been made over this last year is not fully acknowledging how people feel about going to the grocery store, um, paying for, uh, for you know, back to school clothes and things. And I think that the vice president is, you know, straight up acknowledging that um, and then identifying ways in which she can try in a, a presidency to begin to bring some of those prices down. Sarah, the... the Trump campaign has been hitting the Harris campaign on this issue of the economy. And, and at the same time, we've heard the former president put forward, uh, you know, no tax on this, no tax on that, not offering a lot of details about his proposals either. Do, do the details matter? Or how much do the details matter anymore? Is it really just more about what you can say to people and make them feel like I'm going to do more than the other person is going to do? Well, I think the details do matter. But what's, I think, more important in a campaign, particularly one with so much media fragmentation, is to, to be disciplined about your message. And so... You know, uh, uh, Trump could hit back very effectively on that message uh, from the vice president. I mean, the, the vice president and the president put forward a proposal that, you know, put trillions of dollars 
in this economy, which caused the inflation problem, which caused groceries to go up, which caused rents to go up. And they need to capitalize on that. And he needs to much more effectively, I think, tie her to the Biden economy. And that is something that has been lost a little bit in the conversation over the course of the last six weeks. Um, and there was a reason voters were so frustrated with Joe Biden. It wasn't just because of some of his failing health. It was because of the economy. And I think Trump needs to, to tie her to that. Is it too late? I mean, to say no. that he needs to, and that's not something, you're not saying something new. Well, that no, we've heard people say he needs to do this more, and yet... Well, he, he gets off message, you know, and so I think my point is, like, he needs to be very disciplined about it. If this, if this is an election that's decided on the economy and immigration, which is certainly an economic issue, it's an election he can win. If it's an election where we only talk about abortion and joy, she's probably going to come out on top. And so that is the challenge for him as a, as a presidential candidate, is to be on terrain that is favorable to him. The cake is baked on the economy. Yeah. Th this rate hike isn't going to affect everyday Americans for several months. They feel what they feel. Um, and they don't only vote on the economy, but it's a major factor. But the, they have to also be reminded of how we got here. So, Donna, if, if the idea is that Trump mm -hmm. needs to stay on message, we've seen that not be the case more often than it is. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity for the Harris campaign to fill that, that space? And, and what message do they need to then craft in order to take advantage of a, a lack of discipline? Well, look, I think that you're hearing that, and I think Sarah is absolutely right. I'm, uh, the uh, Harris campaign has been very disciplined, both uh, her running mate, Tim Walls, but also uh, the vice president herself in talking about the economy and talking about the way people feel and in talking about her ideas to help uh, bring a stronger economy to people's uh, pocketbooks and their, their um, kitchen tables. So I do think that the uh, Harris campaign has actually been able to capitalize on the fact that there is a lack of discipline and message on the other side, but also that she has some ideas that she repeats over and over and over again, and that's working to her advantage. Julia, I do want to put up this new Quinnipiac poll that's out from Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, showing that, that Donald Trump uh, only has a slight edge among likely voters on who would be better for the economy, who would handle it better, especially in the must-win state of mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, obviously. Is that good news for the Harris campaign? You know, I think it's potentially good news. I'd like to see those numbers on registered voters for, uh, as well. But I think it is, um, you know, good news if she's able to close that edge nationally. She has, it seems like she has a wider edge in general. But on the economy, I think for the Harris campaign, they got to be they got to be careful. I mean, I think if she talks more about it, you know, is more detailed, she has started to do that. I think that plays to her advantage. I do want to turn to one other topic and some uh, reporting, Sarah, from the Wall Street Journal. We'll put some of this up on the screen uh, related to, to Springfield. Ohio, a uh, Vance spokesperson on Tuesday provided the Wall Street Journal with a police report in which a resident had claimed her pet may have been taken by Haitian neighbors. But when a reporter went to Ann Kilgore's house Tuesday evening, she said her cat, Miss Sassy, which went missing in late August, had actually been returned or had actually returned a few days later, found safe in her own basement. The Trump campaign continues to push this false narrative uh, about, about Springfield, Ohio. Is it, is, it, is it a lack of discipline? Is there any strategic value to talking about this? Who are they trying to, to speak to? I, I don't understand why we're still talking about it. I don't understand why they're still talking about it. I don't understand why they would submit a police report uh, after all the noise that we've had over the course of the last couple of weeks on this issue. I, I, th this, <laughs> you said what you said. Maybe you regretted saying it. Maybe there's one example somewhere that somebody said that's genuinely true. Who knows at this point? Move on. Go back to the economy. Go back to the issues that you can win the election on. Like, it, it, I, I, I don't have a good answer for yeah. you. Uh, Donna, we did hear the, the vice president address this briefly uh, yesterday at the NABJ event. Uh, she said it was, a, it was, it was sad. It was, it was a sad situation. But do you think the Harris Walls campaign needs to speak more about this issue and about how it's impacting this this community of, of, of Haitians in the Springfield area? Or are they avoiding this because of the, the immigration issue? Uh, look, I don't think they're avoiding it. But I mean, when you have um, JD Vance and Donald Trump walking all in the muck every single day, why get in their way? Yeah. All right. We will leave it there. <laughs> Donna, Sarah, Julia. Thank you. Both. Oh, thank you all.
Well, after the break, new explosions rock Lebanon today as U.S. officials say Israel was behind yesterday's stunning and deadly attack that simultaneously detonated hundreds of wireless pagers belonging to Hezbollah members. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Another wave of explosions of devices in Lebanon today. Take a look at the scene after today's attack, which reportedly targeted handheld communication devices. The Lebanese health ministry says 14 people were killed in today's incident and more than 450 others were hurt. The country's civil defense said they were working to put out fires in some 60 homes and shops in southern Lebanon. Now, this follows the attacks yesterday when thousands of pagers belonging to members of Hezbollah simultaneously detonated 12 dead there, injuring 13, rather 3,000 others. Two U.S. officials telling NBC News that Israel was behind that attack yesterday. Separately, two U.S. officials said that Israel told the administration it would take some kind of action in Lebanon, but that the U.S. was caught by surprise when they saw reports of exploding beepers. Now, as tensions between Israel and Hezbollah continue to escalate today, Israel's defense minister said the IDF was opening a new phase in the war, with the focus moving towards Israel's northern border with Lebanon. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has the latest now from Tel Aviv. For a second day in a row, we are seeing a chain of explosions tearing through Lebanon. Yesterday, it was pagers in the hands, in the belts, in the pockets of Hezbollah members that were blowing up. Today, according to Lebanese state media, it is walkie-talkies. These blasts happening in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, but also in the south of the country near the Israeli border, and in the east in one of the Hezbollah strongholds in the Beka Valley. And hospitals are struggling to deal with an influx of what seems to be around 3,000 wounded people. Now, Israel is refusing to comment one way or another as to whether it was responsible for these attacks. But earlier tonight, Israel's defense minister is saying, we have entered a new phase of the war and that Israel will be shifting troops and equipment from the fight in, against Hamas in Gaza to the fight against Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, two U.S. officials tell NBC News that Israel was responsible for the pager attacks yesterday, and it appears that what we are seeing now is a new phase of that ongoing covert Israeli operation. The New York Times citing two officials say that Israeli agents smuggled small amounts of explosives into these communications devices. It's not clear at what point in the supply chain they were able to do that. But one of the big questions is, will this cause Hezbollah to back down or will it provoke them into all out war? Back to you. Up next, some breaking news now. A judge set to hand down a decision on whether to release Sean Diddy Combs from custody. That's after the music mogul was arrested and denied bail yesterday on sex trafficking and racketeering charges. That's coming up next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. And welcome back. We are staying on top of this breaking news out of New York City, where right now a federal judge is deciding whether to grant Sean Diddy Combs' appeal to release him on bail. Now, this is an appeal to a different judge's initial ruling yesterday. That ruling denied the music mogul's request for bail, of course. That came hours after the Justice Department unsealed a sweeping indictment against Combs, accusing him of using his power and money to abuse, threaten, and traffic women. Combs facing three federal charges now, racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking by force, fraud or coercion, and transportation to engage in prostitu prostitution. He's pleaded not guilty to all three of those counts. With me now is Danny Savalos, criminal defense attorney and an NBC News legal analyst. Danny, appreciate you being here today. Um, so how often do defendants in cases like this actually get bail as we think about all that was laid out, um, particularly yesterday, uh, in, in the prosecution trying to keep him in jail. The key is the phrase cases like this, because the Bail Reform Act is a federal law that creates a kind of presumption or default that defendants should be released pending trial. However, for certain kinds of crimes, that presumption actually flips. And in the case of sex trafficking being one of those crimes, the presumption is now that the defendant will be detained unless he can show that he is neither a flight risk 
nor a danger to the public at large. And that's really the battle here. Those are the standards, but every case is unique in its facts. And so the defense here has mostly focused not on the facts alleged in the indictment, but more about all the Herculean efforts they say they're making uh, that Diddy has made by coming to New York in advance of his indictment, handing over his passport, putting up uh, $50 million, putting up his home, having his family put up their passports. All of these efforts he's going to make to assure the judge that he will show up for trial, not threaten anyone, and perhaps most importantly, not obstruct justice. I'm interested in your read on just sort of how the judicial system works, right? Is it, is it common for a magistrate judge to deny bail and then have that ruling reversed on appeal to a potential trial judge a day later? Yeah, that's not really, procedurally what's happening here is that the arraignment is always handled by a magistrate who does address detention. So this isn't so much of an appeal as just having the district court who's in charge of the case mm. hear the actual bail hearing, which is not that unusual at all. It's not an appeal in the sense that it's not going up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. It's not a final judgment. It's an issue of bail, which can and often is revisited, but in this case, I think the district court judge may be somewhat swayed by the findings already made by the magistrate, which is why, no surprise, the government, being very good at what they do, already filed a letter itemizing all the findings that the magistrate judge made as a persuasive argument to the judge, the district judge, saying, hey, look, these are all the things that the judge already found. He is a flight risk. He is a danger. We're concerned he's going to contact witnesses. So keep things the way they are. That's the government's argument today. All right, Danny Savalos for us today. Danny, thank you. And still to come, ballot battles inside the RNC's push to get more Republican voters to embrace early voting, despite former President Trump's conflicting messages. This is Meet the Press Now. And welcome back. If you were looking for proof that the election is just around the corner, take a look at this. Workers down the street from us here hammering in the first nail for the inauguration platform outside the Capitol. This is ahead of Inauguration Day, of course. Absentee ballots have also been mailed in a handful of states and polls close in just 48 days. Now, as they have for multiple cycles, Democrats and the DNC are encouraging early voting all across the country. The RNC is also starting to encourage Republican voters to get to the polls early this time, despite some resistance from their nominee. NBC News campaign in bed Jake Trailer has more. Early voting. Advocates say it can increase turnout and help more people be able to vote. In-person early voting is expected to kick off in several states in the coming days. In the U.S., all states allow early ballots to be cast by mail or in person. Of that, 36 states, including Washington, D.C., allow early voting without a required excuse or reasoning. The Republican National Committee, encouraging and embracing early voting this cycle. We have set up an effort to reach out, call it an early vote program nationwide. Despite resistance from the top of the ticket. They have early voting, late voting, everything is so ridiculous. We should have one day voting, paper ballots, voter ID, and certification of citizenship. That suspicion from Mr. Trump echoed by some of his supporters. I think we should just have the day of voting I mean, paper ballots is what I'm thinking. Same-day voting and having that, what he wants for us, it's amazing because we don't want another stolen election. I don't think there should be early voting. I believe there should be um, picture voting, photograph voting. In May, just 37% of Republicans said people should have the option to vote early without giving a specific reason. A sharp contrast to Democrats' support of 82%. Michael Watley and Laura Trump, the Trump-backed leaders of the Republican National Committee, crisscrossed the country this summer, encouraging early voting. The message from President Trump is very clear. It is great if you want to vote early. It is great if you want to vote by mail. But on the very same day in July, Mr. Trump gave a contrary message, one that election security and legal experts say is false. Uh, a lot of things happen with the early voting that are no good. Look, anytime you have mail-in voting, you're going to have fraud. Whether and, and some people don't like me saying it, but I say it. Still, Mr. Trump voted early himself in Florida's primary election and has encouraged it online. So whether it's mail-in ballots, early voting, voting on the day, you got to get out and vote. Leaving some supporters caught between their candidate 
and convenience. I think same day voting is a good idea because it keeps it more honest. Uh, the mail outs, that's a kind of a catch 22. Would you ever do early voting or mail in voting? Or would... We do whatever. And usually it's early voting. Jake Trailer, NBC News. Jake Trailer reporting there. We are back with more Meet the Press Now tomorrow. The news continues with Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.